Yes, we can. Yeah. Uh, with your permission, uh, let me start. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, uh, welcome to this, uh, the last day of uh, Energy Award and the Energy Efficiency Summit 2021. My name is uh, Murali Krishnan. I work with CII as a principal counselor. Uh, so before uh, requesting our, uh, our respected and uh, senior uh, speakers to uh, start the session, uh, thanks for uh, thanks to all of you for joining us for the last one month. Like India and our culture is uh, uh, famous for festivals, we uh, we we celebrate our festivals in a grand way. So uh, like that, our for our uh, CII and GBC Green Business Center, the August month was a festival month. We had a series of events. Uh, every week uh, starting from sugar summit uh, starting from uh, paper tech power plant summit now we had a lot of uh, uh, interaction during the last four days uh, as a part of our energy award and energy summit hope all of you enjoyed it and today we are on the climax climax day but uh, this climax will be a happy and sweet climax because uh, 180 companies are going to receive the awards. They are very much thrilled and they are anxious. I hope all of you with that uh, uh, anxiety, you will also enjoy uh, today's sessions. We have uh, uh, our first session uh, uh, discussing on uh, the latest advancements in energy efficient uh, technologies. Any activity, uh, for example, whatever may be the activity, whatever may be the cause, you need always uh, need the pattern. We need the supporting organizations who uh, support us and then uh, we have uh, danfos and androids uh, supporting us for this uh, uh, entire month uh, the energy efficiency summit and then the energy award so we have uh, two great gentlemen from danfos and the androids who will be taking us uh, uh, through uh, the latest technologies uh, so uh, with this uh, few words and uh, followed by uh, today's uh, this uh, energy efficient technology session, we have a lot of uh, great people talking to us today. We have our chairman, uh, Mr. Ravichandran Purushottaman talking on uh, the future of energy efficiency at 11.30. We have Mr. Garnayak who is going to help us how uh, accumulation, agglomeration can help us to grade the, uh, take the energy efficiency and our country to way forward. They have demonstrated it. And he is going to tell about the future plans, what EESL is planning for up to 12 o'clock. And then uh, we have uh, uh, from ICRA, the, the, the economics point of view, we have a, a master speaker from uh, Mr. Vipin Jindal. And then uh, we also have uh, 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 people from IEA, uh, the head of energy efficiency, Mr. Brian Motherway, going to talk about uh, talk us about uh, what is our future and uh, how IEA can support what other countries are doing, what we can replicate, is going to talk about that. Followed by, uh, we also have Indian Energy Exchange, who will help us how we can uh, monetize, how we can trade our energy efficiency and renewable energy milestones. That will be at uh, 250. And uh, finally, uh, from World Bank and uh, the US uh, Energy Agency, Mr. Padu S. Padmanabhan is going to help us uh, uh, to talk on uh, the energy efficiency and its future. And uh, finally, at the 4.30, we'll all come to know who are all the uh, the winners. All are winners, but uh, who are all the great achievers? We, we are going to uh, come to know about that at uh, 4.30, where our judges, the jury team, uh, uh, how they have evaluated and uh, what is their opinion, we'll be able to know that. That will be at uh, 4.30. So we have a long day of session, uh, long day session. And then I hope all of you will uh, uh, stay with us. And then, as I mentioned, we had a series of events in the last one month. All of that will be uploaded in our website. You can still visit to all the stalls in the exhibition area. Please do that whenever you have free time and it will be open for a few more days. You can definitely go through it and then you can interact with us. So uh, coming back to uh, our session, we have uh, Mr. Sujit Pai who has uh, decades of experience uh, uh, with the uh, Danfoss and uh, internationally he has worked in other countries. So uh, he is going to uh, take us through uh, engineering a green and energy efficient tomorrow. Over to you, Mr. Sujit Pai, and uh, we look forward to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Malik. So uh, to start off, good morning. Good morning, everyone. And uh, I think there's a quick video we'd like to play. So if you could just play the video and then I can uh, get started with the presentation.
Jishnu sound is not coming. Let me check that. India is the world's fastest growing economy. Ranks second worldwide in farm output. Intends to generate 100 gigawatts of cumulative solar capacity by 2022 and reduce its carbon emissions by 30% by 2030. However, two thirds of the country is yet to be built. 25% of its agricultural produce is lost along the food chains. Expects per capita electricity consumption for infrastructure to grow by 11 times by 2047. And will grapple with an increase in CO2 footprint due to rapid urbanization. India is both a dream and a challenge. Danfoss, founded by Mads Clausen in 1930 in the town of Nordborg, Denmark, has been engineering technologies that enable the world of tomorrow to do more with less. Today, Danfoss has an enviable presence across 100 countries with 63 factories and a committed task force of over 26,000 employees and is enhancing the lives of millions across the globe. For five decades, Van Foss has been serving global and Indian customers through its strong manufacturing footprint spread across Chennai, Pune, and Baroda. Sprawling over 50 acres, our center of excellence at Chennai houses a world-class R&D center. Versatile production facilities and an efficient supply chain system that stands testimony to our commitment to quality driven products. The LEED Platinum Certified Danfoss India Campus demonstrates our commitment to reduce its energy consumption and carbon footprint by 50% by 2030. With a one megawatt solar plant on campus and with 60% of the energy needs catered to by renewable sources, the Danfoss India campus is pushing the limits on sustainability. India is emerging. And Danfoss, we engineer technologies that can help India fulfill its potential to become the fulcrum of the global economy. Enabling sustainable urbanization by creating energy efficient infrastructure. Empowering India to become the food basket of the world by transforming food supply and reducing food losses. Tackling climate change through technological advancements, creating carbon neutral cities. Transforming electrification by powering electric mobility and decentralizing energy storage and transmission. Driving digitization in India through smarter technological products and digitally connected solutions. Danfoss has been a committed partner to India in enhancing its productivity, increasing energy efficiency, and ensuring sustainability. We are Danfoss. We are engineering tomorrow's India today. Thank you. Um, can I have control to share my screen, please?
All right, so hope you all enjoyed that video and uh, good morning to um, to everyone. Um, you know, technology is is what drives all of us today. And then uh, when we have technology, you know, we also have technological glitches, so part and parcel of, of life. Um, so I'll uh, quickly go through the agenda in, in the next uh, 10 to 15 minutes. You know, I'll take you through uh, uh, the different segments that we have in Danforce, uh, the markets we serve, uh, the global mega trends that we see as of today, um, how Danforce is enabling a green transition, uh, which is related to these mega trends. Uh, we'll also talk a little bit about the latest technologies we have in drives and how, how that's changing, and uh, then talk about a few application uh, examples. Uh, so to start off, um, so to start off, uh, Danforce uh, predominant, predominantly has three segments. So we've got uh, Danforce Power Solutions, uh, which is uh, predominantly into electronics and hydraulics for uh, mobility. We've got Danforce Climate Solutions, uh, which is you know wherever you have heating and cooling, we have valves, we have compressors that enables us to have um, well controlled. Uh, uh, the buildings, and uh, then we have Danforce drives, uh, which I'm responsible for in India, and uh, we'll uh, we'll deep dive into that and spend most of our time today on how Danforce drives can enable a greener future. Um, overall, uh, Danforce uh, has been related to uh, all the different kinds of sustainability activities and areas uh, in India uh, and globally. Uh, as far as we're concerned, by 2030, uh, we want to reduce uh, the carbon footprint by 50%. Uh, just few of the things that we're doing as Danforce, for example, is by 2030, we want to have an uh, all electric uh, company uh, fleet. Uh, one of the other examples is we already have a solar plant uh, in our factory and we're just about uh, finishing commissioning a storage plant so that the energy generated on the weekends can uh, also be used uh, during the week uh, and, and we increase the use of renewable energy. So uh, looking into our world and uh, looking into where these, these different segments play, when we talk about Danforce power solutions, we touch a lot of different industries like construction, forestry, agriculture, as well as industry. Uh, climate solutions, we're into heating, cooling, you know, it could be district heating, it could be hotels, it could be commercial buildings. And then we have Danforce drives, uh, and, and we'll talk more about that, but again, it's industries, uh, breweries, automotive, and uh, buildings, buildings again. So uh, these are some of the different uh, markets that we serve. And if you just take a look at these things, so um, basically all the areas of uh, high power consumption today, which is commercial buildings, which is the heavy industries, uh, food and beverage, um, energy, you know, natural resources, uh, residential, marine. So these are some of the areas which are uh, predominantly uh, high energy consuming uh, areas. Uh, but when you look at uh, the global mega trends that we have today, uh, I'll just talk about a few of them, but the first one, of course, is uh, digitalization. And uh, if we think about it, uh, you know, more than 80% of the data has been generated over the last couple of years. Uh, what does digitalization mean for us in terms of everyday life? Um, you know, I'll just give you an example. I was at an airport a couple of weeks back. I realized I didn't have my license. I didn't have an ID. Uh, I wasn't allowed to enter the airport. But, you know, because of M Aadhaar and uh, because of DigiLocker, I was able to download or um, get a copy that is officially verifiable by the agencies and I was allowed to get in. And all of that is because of uh, digitalization. So this is a big mega trend, a uh, simple thing like Swiggy, you know, simple thing like food delivery, Uber, um, all of these are all possible through digitalization. But what that means is a lot of data, which means a lot more uh, data centers. Uh, talking about electrification, that's the other big mega trend. Uh, we're moving a lot into renewable energy sources. And as we move into renewable energy sources, uh, electric, electricity becomes the biggest uh, uh, form of uh, um, conversion of energy, storage of energy, and transport of energy. If you just think about electric vehicles, on the other hand, um, you know, when Tesla initially came out, uh, EV was a dream. And uh, today you have most of the big uh, companies talk about how by 2025 or by 2030, uh, they're not going to be making IC engines anymore, and they're only going to be making electric vehicles. Uh, urbanization, that's the uh, the other big uh, mega trend that we're seeing. So, um, you know, the population is expected to go up to about 8.6 uh, billion by, uh, you know, by, by 2030. Uh, today, more than 70% uh, of our energy consumption comes from uh, urban areas. And if you look at 2030, we're expecting about 70% of our population to be living in urban areas. So again, that means a lot more energy consumption than we have today. 
the other big mega trend that we're seeing is uh, food. You know, as population goes up, uh, today one of the big issues that we have is uh, one third of our food is wasted. Uh, we're we're still working on that. Uh, I don't think we have a solution there. But what that means for us is, as our population grows, you know, we need to increase our uh, food supply. We need to increase food production. That again is a very energy energy intensive uh, process. So all of this, you know, when it comes to digitalization, electrification, urbanization, food supply, all of these big, big mega trends are uh, really leading to an increase in energy consumption. And uh, this, on the other hand, is uh, leading to climate change, which we really want to do something about. Um, if you look at the greenhouse gases, you know, they've increased by more than 50% since 1990. Um, energy efficiency and renewable energy are the only ways we can go to a low carbon world. Um, we, we don't want to, to go back in, in time in terms of development. We want to continue to develop as human beings. We want to continue to stay in comfortable homes, work in comfortable offices. Uh, we want to continue to use uh, digital technologies to make our lives easier. But at the same time, we want to do that in a way where uh, our global warming is limited to 1.5 uh, degrees above pre-industrial times. And that's what the Paris Agreement uh, uh, is. So the question is, uh, how does Danfoss play a role in all of these? And uh, this is where we talk about uh, the green transition. So we spoke about all the megatrends. And when you talk about megatrends, uh, the first uh, image you see on your left is uh, the Shanghai Tower, which is uh, one of the tallest buildings uh, in the world. Um, you know, we've been able to get 40% energy savings there uh, purely by installing uh, 660 Danfoss drives. Uh, data centers, the other big one, as we get more and more digital, uh, we're going to have a lot more data centers. Uh, the more we shop online, of course, it's a big convenience, but to be able to shop online, uh, you need to have more and more servers, more and more data, which means, again, more and more servers. And uh, energy savings of 30% is what's been demonstrated using Danfoss uh, drives here. So a uh, few examples here, but again, I won't go through all of them. Um, you know, we've uh, the, the world's most powerful electric ferry is, is driven by uh, Danfoss drives, which causes about 2,000 tons of uh, uh, carbon dioxide uh, savings. Um, we've got electric buses uh, that we've been able to run, which is 100% carbon reduction. And uh, that's really how we play a role in this green transition. But uh, really, um, what we're trying to say here is in all of these areas which are necessary, uh, which are going to increase based on the global mega trends, we have a lot of potential to actually save energy uh, using our uh, technology. And I'll talk about a few of them uh, uh, in, in a little more detail. But uh, this one is, you know, big one, uh, one of the world's largest, uh, tallest buildings. And uh, by providing balancing valves, providing drives, uh, we've been able to, to decrease uh, or rather increase energy savings by uh, 40%. Um, U.S. Steel Tower, uh, this is, uh, this is uh, uh, an example uh, that I like to talk about because uh, this is an old building. Uh, it's the same building. It was built a long time ago. But what we've been able to do is go and retrofit into that building, go and put, on, put in drives, and uh, you know that has resulted in a savings of about 1.1 million USD in energy. Uh, of course, uh, cost of energy saving is a good indicator, but uh, really the more cost you save in energy, uh, the more you're making the world uh, sustainable, the more you're helping in terms of uh, carbon dioxide and greenhouse um, gas reduction. Um, data center, the other big one that, uh, that that I talk about because that's the fastest growing right now. And when you look at all data centers to make sure that the servers work, to make sure that the apps we want to use work when we want to use them, uh, it's essential that these are all air conditioned. And uh, when you when you air condition uh, all of these, uh, then uh, speed control of the AC using our drives helps us save 30% uh, of the energy. Uh, typically, what would happen is today again, uh, you know, in people's homes, you hear of inverter ACs. But uh, going back in time, ACs would be on off or ACs would be on all the time. And, uh, you know, you would use uh, valves to actually reduce the flow, increase the flow, but the energy consumption would remain the same. Uh, this is where Danfoss drives come in. And uh, what we're able to do is uh, use our drives, uh, control the speed of the AC units, and then actually save energy and uh, um, reduce emissions. So uh, basically, if you look at all the different industries and you look at a lot of applications across them, um, you know, all of these, uh, when you look at the mega trends that we spoke about, be it HVAC, be it food and beverage, you know, water, as population increases, uh, water is a big requirement. Uh, as more and more people need food, refrigeration becomes more and more important. Uh, marine, you know, um, we're all hearing about uh, uh, supply issues. We're all hearing about how long freight takes these days, which is all because of uh, 
um, the seas and the ships. And again, marine has become a big, big area there, which is going to grow. And uh, all of these areas, all of these industries, you have a lot of different applications where uh, Danfoss can actually come in. Uh, we're not going to have time to go over all of them in detail, but the picture I'd like to show you here just talks about how across these different industries, across these different applications, wherever you have fans, wherever you have motors, wherever you have anything that rotates, uh, Danfoss drives can come in and make sure that instead of keeping a motor running at the same speed uh, all the time, irrespective of what's required, uh, we're able to control the speed there. We're able to switch on and switch off when required. Uh, we optimize based on the requirement and the amount of energy saving that we can get through that is just phenomenal. Um, that's the first move that we made, uh, starting as Danfoss drives, where instead of directly controlling a motor uh, as on off, we put a drive and we actually control the speed to save energy as well as have better control of the process. But looking ahead, uh, when you look at the latest technologies that we have, we're looking at two things more and more. One is making the drive itself more powerful, uh, which makes it more intelligent, and then making sure that we use the drive as a sensor. Um, you know, the drive is connected to motors, and uh, that's driving pretty much everything in an industry, in a building, in a HVAC system. And uh, what, what the drive can get is current and voltage data, real-time data. And through this data, there are a few things that we can do. The first one, of course, is, of course, energy saving is, is the key here. But as we save energy, one of the other opportunities that we have using drives and the latest technology is making sure that we can also monitor all the applications. We can monitor if there are issues and basically you know, uh, do predictive maintenance, condition-based monitoring um, without having to wait for a failure to happen. Um, again, that helps in multiple ways because it means that you do not have to have backup capacity installed. That saves energy, that saves money, uh, but also make sure that you have continuous processes going on and uh, no interruptions based on this data that you can get. Uh, the other thing that's more interesting is, uh, and I'll talk about an example of a supermarket uh, that, that we have um, where, where we're interchanging the heating and cooling systems. But the other thing we can do using the drive as a sensor is make this drive do more intelligent things. Uh, today, when you talk about drives, basically drives are saving energy in terms of um, changing the speed of the motors and the fans based on the exact requirement. Uh, but if you take that a step further, uh, what we can do with drives acting as a sensor is uh, understand what's happening in the environment and then based on that, control processes that help us reuse a lot of things and actually take energy saving to completely the next level. Uh, I'll take a quick example of uh, global su supermarkets, which account for about 2% of total energy consumption. And uh, in cold countries, what happens is you have, um, you, you know, you have all the refrigerators which are used to keep the food cold. Uh, and then, you know, traditionally you would have separate heating systems which are used to heat the supermarket uh, and to heat houses around the supermarket. Uh, what we've been able to do um, using, using our intelligent systems uh, and using the existing infrastructure from a heating and cooling perspective is make sure that we use the heat generated from these cooling systems and use that heat to actually heat supermarkets and to heat houses around. Um, so, you know, when you, when you think about this uh, and when it's been implemented, it seems like it's common sense. Why didn't we ever do that? Uh, but it's technology that was not available e easily earlier. And uh, this is what Danfoss is enabling us to do. Uh, big, big savings, you know, about 70% uh, of, of the heat generated is uh, reused um, compared to earlier where you would have two complete systems, one to generate heat and one to remove heat. And uh, we were not able to reuse any of this. So, so this, is, this is the future, drives getting more and more intelligent, you know, uh, controlling bigger processes and not just saving energy on a specific motor or a fan or a blower, but saving energy on a complete application, um, taking in a lot more inputs. Uh, this just gives you an exact, you know, just a schematic when you look at this uh, re retail refrigeration example. Um, you know, you have a smart grid which can uh, give you um, energy efficiency. You have variable, uh, you have uh, variable renewables. Uh, you can reduce peak demand, and uh, the results of all of this at the end of the day are, you know, lower carbon dioxide emissions. You have improved energy security and you have minimized grid and investment. Um, as an example, you know, if you're able to interchange energy between these two systems using intelligent drives, what you can do is make sure that your peak demand is lower, which means your investment in the grid is lower. Um, and it also means that your 
you know emissions at the end go down so quick example here of of uh, how that can work uh, but lots of other examples that we have uh, and uh, we don't have too much time to get into them but you know marine and offshore which are really increasing in terms of number of applications based on the global mega trends we see and all of these are areas where danforth can actually play a very vital role in terms of helping uh, making it a much more energy efficient process and an energy efficient ecosystem um, I'll very quickly go through some examples. You know, uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about this because this is here in India where Amul wanted to create uh, a fully automated energy efficient plant. And uh, again, this is uh, in Gujarat. Um, we've used uh, drives here. Uh, we've not only been able to completely automate the plant, but uh, we've been able to really reduce energy consumption uh, based on the earlier plants uh, that we had. Uh, water and wastewater, you know, water and wastewater is uh, very important as population goes up. Uh, we take it for granted today because we all live in cities where we have water, uh, wastewater goes out of our houses, but there's a lot of process happening at the background and uh, there's a lot of energy that's actually utilized when uh, you have to manage this whole water and wastewater ecosystem. Um, so, again, uh, lots of technology that we've implemented here, uh, you know, uh, Wabag is uh, one of the companies in India, for example, that we work with extensively, where we've done projects to actually reduce the total energy consumption in a water and wastewater plant. Um, again, using drives uh, to to, uh, to run the pumps and the motors uh, to actually circulate water and move water from one place to the other. Um, you know, go through the processes of treating the water. So all of these processes, which are typically very energy con energy intensive. Are now driven by drives, uh, Danfoss drives, which help reduce a lot of the energy uh, consumption. Uh, HVAC is the other big thing. Um, you know, uh, look, you look at uh, all the big infrastructure investments in India today. We've got a lot of new airports. Uh, we've got a lot of new uh, hospitals. We've got a lot of uh, new pharma plants, and all of these need big HVAC systems. And uh, Danfoss drives are used in these HVAC systems to, uh, you know, in the chillers, in um, uh, the AHUs. Uh, in the blowers to actually reduce the energy consumption. Uh, another example, just to show you how we get involved in the complete project and look at every area of uh, energy conservation. Um, you know, in the Mumbai International Airport, uh, in addition to doing the HVAC system, if you look at the conveyor, for example, typically uh, the conveyor runs nonstop. Uh, the conveyor uh, uses, you know, chain system and a pulley system, and uh, you have the oil that needs to be changed, you know, very frequently. And what we were able to do is again, uh, Mr. Sujit, yes. sorry for interrupting. You have two more minutes to conclude. Sure, no problem. So uh, using uh, using using uh, drives, we were able to reduce the maintenance because we got rid of chain driven systems, and uh, we were able to make this uh, completely energy uh, efficient. Um, the other last thing that I want to talk about is, you know, as we get into urbanization, as we look at the growth of India, uh, metros are uh, one of the big solutions to our traffic and decongestion. Uh, we're very proud to say in India that uh, we have a 90% share in all the metros. If you look at the tunnel ventilation fans, if you look at uh, the AHUs, uh, if you look at uh, um, just, just the exhaust recirculation fans used in the metros and the metro stations. Uh, drives have been used in all of these metro projects to reduce energy consumption because um, our government wants to do this in a sustainable way as well. So again, big impact uh, from Danforth here where we're enabling metros, enabling better trans uh, transportation, but we also do that in an energy efficient way. Um, just, you know, very quickly, our heavy industries, cranes and hoists, you know, Marine and offshore, uh, these are the other areas where um, there's a lot of energy consumption in general and uh, using Danforth technologies, we make sure that we can continue to do this, continue to develop the world, but do this in a way where you have the least impact on the environment and in certain cases, reuse a lot of the energy. So uh, that's us, that's Danforth, we're engineering tomorrow. Uh, we're looking at uh, how we can make this world a more sustainable place. So um, that was uh, my short overview of what we do and uh, you know, uh, happy to connect with any of you at any point to answer any questions that you have. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Sujit. Thanks for the excellent presentation. Uh, like uh, Danfoss is there uh, everywhere. Uh, you also covered uh, all the sectors, all the applications with a uh, lot of examples, a lot of savings. Uh, thank you very much for your time and your presentation. I hope the participants uh, would have got, uh, each one would have got some idea and they will be in touch with you during the exhibition. We will have the question answer. I request all the participants maybe put their questions in the chat box so that the speakers can uh, reply to that directly or we can take it up at the end of the 
session if we have uh, further time. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Sujit. Now I would request uh, Mr. Praveen, uh, Regional Director from Andrits. All of us uh, uh, carry a pump with us. Our pump is our heart. Like uh, like our body, like all the industries have, uh, the pumps are very important, whether it is building or whether it is home, whether it is industry, whether it is any sector, pumps are important. And we have uh, with us uh, Mr. Praveen, who has more than uh, two decades of experience in pumps. He has been there in all the aspects of the pumps. Uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Praveen, can you please uh, share your screen and then uh, take us through uh, the energy efficient pumping technology, what you have with, uh, to us. Uh, and each participant will be very eager to see what they can apply in their own uh, application area or industry. Over to you, Mr. Praveen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for uh, this opportunity to present our uh, uh, company here in Energy Efficiency Summit. Uh, now today I'm going to talk about the innovative pumping technology for power industry uh, for uh, industries. And uh, first of all, uh, something about uh, me as uh, already uh, uh, it was introduced. Uh, uh, I work for added separation and pump technology uh, in Chennai, and uh, I have about 20 years of experience in pump and pumping industry. And I'm working uh, for Andrit since last nine years. And throughout the career, I have been to pump industry. Uh, so now, uh, after me, uh, something about my company from where I belong to. And uh, I belong to Andrit's group. Andrit is a global leading supplier of uh, plant equipment system and services for many industries, including pulp and paper, metalworking, steel industry, hydropower plant pumps and also solid liquid separation in municipal and industrial sectors. Uh, Andritz is headquartered in Graz, Austria, and we have about 280 production and sales and service companies worldwide and uh, about uh, 27,000 people working for Andritz. The company is uh, listed in Vienna Stock Exchange and uh, uh, here in India also we have uh, six companies working uh, from Andritz. So Andritz is a world market uh, leader with four business area where we operate and we are very proud to say that uh, all four business area where we work, we hold the position between one to five. We are uh, uh, active in pulp and paper uh, where we do complete uh, pulp and paper plant starting from uh, pulper to finished product including recovery boiler and uh, non-oven uh, clothes and uh, uh, non oven industry production sites, and also we do uh, pulp and paper, the complete uh, pollution control uh, equipments like FGD and uh, other environmental services. In hydroway area, we do complete uh, hydro uh, electromechanical plants for uh, hydropower plant. Also, the pumps is also uh, coming into this business area, and we also produce turbo generator under the hydro. Business area. In metal sector, we supply uh, forming metal forming machines. Uh, like uh, I will give one example: the 95% of uh, Indian coins also printed by Andrix machines in uh, many uh, mints of uh, uh, Indian government. And uh, the, we also supply the stainless steel, carbon steel, and non-ferrous and non-ferrous. Uh, a step in the steel furnace and plants uh, for metal industry. In separation business area, we do uh, many solid and liquid separation equipment in municipalities and uh, also for industries and uh, animal and feed biomass pallets uh, we produce in this uh, business area like decanters, centrifuges, all are part of our business area. So since uh, uh, I'm here to talk about the pump business. Uh, Andrix uh, is having six locations for pumps manufacturing. And uh, in India, we are located in Chennai, where we have uh, invested for a pump assembly and uh, testing plant. So energy efficiency uh, in pumping industry. And uh, how Andrix is doing that, I, I want to take you into that uh, uh, tour. 
So uh, first of all, our all the products are IIoT enabled and uh, it's a digitalization uh, under our mattress uh, uh, brand is uh, already, uh, which is covering all four business area and know-how of the, all the industries and uh, technologies which we uh, uh, provide from uh, Andreds Group. So the mattress is an umbrella uh, where we uh, basically uh, cover our digitalization programs and softwares. And in, under that, uh, the pump, uh, our all the pumps are uh, equipped uh, with, uh, and it's all uh, IoT enables, and uh, digitalization is also possible for all the pumping uh, equipments, whatever we are supplying, including complete automations. So today, uh, I'm going uh, about this energy efficiency in industry. If we talk about, uh, as uh, Mr. Murli Kishan already said, uh, the pump play a very vital role in uh, industries and uh, also in our uh, buildings or wherever we uh, go, even in our everyday life. And it has the same vital role, but uh, the heart is playing in our body. Means uh, the heart circulate the complete uh, uh, it's regulate and circulate the blood uh, to our body and the same way the pump is also very crucial in, in this, uh, any of the industries or uh, municipalities or life so wherever we go we need water and we need liquid and uh, pump is uh, required to uh, to transfer that liquid from one place to another place and uh, this uh, pumps uh, in uh, industry uh, worldwide depend on various type of pumping system in our uh, daily life and these uh, systems account for approximately 20 percent of the world industry in electrical energy demand and it's range from 25 to 50 percent of uh, energy uses in certain industries uh, in or in plant operations and uh, uh, today, if we see about uh, the life cycle cost of a pump, approximately 70 to 85 percent cost are, are belongs to energy cost. This means there is a lot of scope for energy efficiency improvement and uh, uh, continuous uh, uh, technology, technological so, uh, advancement and solutions. So. 70 to 85 percent cost is belongs to energy in its whole life and then 10 to 20 percent is uh, uh, for maintenance and uh, approximately 5 to 10 percent uh, in uh, is other cost and 5 to 15 percent is only the initial cost which we invest to buy a pump this means the initial cost of uh, uh, pumping system is very low as compared to the other cost which we invest in the whole life of a pumping system. So, when we talk about life cycle cost of a pump, there is a certain guideline by uh, Hydraulic Institute of a Standard or ISO, uh, which uh, uh, have defined how to calculate the life cycle cost of a equipment. So we already know uh, that uh, uh, LCC is basically life cycle cost uh, of any of the mechanical or pumping system, mechanical equipment or pumping system, basically. because the, uh, this uh, guideline is also can be used for uh, other uh, equipment, uh, mechanical equipment in your plant or systems. So this is not only for the develop, especially for pump, but uh, it can be uh, this can be also used for pump because it has been already uh, um, endorsed by Hydraulic Institute of a Standard and also uh, by the Euro Pump Association in Europe. So uh, initial cost, if we see, then installation, energy cost, uh, operational cost, maintenance cost, downtime cost, environmental cost, this all and decommissioning cost, this all are going to cost when we take a decision of buying a pump. So we must look for uh, the life cycle cost instead of only the uh, initial investment cost uh, for uh, pumps uh, when we are whenever we are uh, making the decision to buy a pump pumping system or pumps for our industries so what is the reason uh, why the efficiencies uh, 
deteriorate why this uh, uh, decision or consideration for uh, life cycle cost is important because we know for this is the uh, rotating equipment and for any of the rotating equipment if it's run in life uh, it will see the hydraulic deterioration and i will say there is no any equipment which efficiency cannot be deteriorated it has to be deteriorated so how to prevent only what we can do we can we can uh, select a pumping system we can use the pumping system which have the lowest life cycle cost or lowest hydraulic deterioration the identified reason for this uh, hydraulic deterioration is basically first of all is corrosion and in corrosion i will say there is no material which is anti corrosion it will corrode any of the material it has to be it have the life it, it, it's not 100% anti anti corrosion so it uh, the efficiency has to be uh, corroded and uh, if we see the corrosion it's not only the only single type of uh, corrosion which is happening in hydraulic machines it's a, there are a lot of other uh, corrosion uh, like pitting corrosion we have stress corrosion we have interangular corrosion and we have cres uh, crevice uh, corrosion any type of corrosion and then erosion erosion of internal cellulases that also deteriorates the hydraulic then cavitation oxidization increase in surface roughness then mechanical wear these are all are basically the reason for hydraulic deterioration and then finally what happen the over the period when we are buying the new machine uh, our efficiencies are basically very high and we can say we can uh, we can be very happy that uh, yeah we uh, got a machine which have a very high efficiency but over the period of operation the performance of uh, the pump and pumping system deteriorates this means we cannot 100% prevent but we can take the measures which can have the lowest efficiency degradation over the period of operation so you, we can say when, once the pump is running then this uh, flow versus head and efficiency also deteriorate and uh, you can see the dotted line how the hydraulic efficiency and performance is deteriorating and finally the system efficiency is going down by down down so we when we are buying a pumping system then what basically uh, we should look for what what we should have in mind to uh, uh, by a, pump, a good pumping system that is the life cycle cost so if we consider the whole life cycle cost and the um, um, hydraulic efficiency deterioration over the period of running and then if we calculate the whole complete life cycle cost then we will be able to find out what exactly the equipment or pumping system is going to cost in its life so some of the checklist has been also developed by hydraulic institute and euro pumps uh, that is uh, to consider all the relevant costs to determine the life cycle cost procure pumps and system using lcc consideration and uh, not only by uh, having uh, the initial cost of the equipment optimize total cost by considering operation cost and procurement cost consider the duration of individual pump duty points match the equipment to the system need for maximum benefit match the pump type and intended duty don't oversize the pump which is one of the major blunders we are doing in our system and industry that we always uh, keep a uh, lot of margin which basically uh, make our pumps uh, uh, very inefficient match the driver type of in, uh, intended duty and specify motor to be high efficiency like we have now i3 and i4, I4 motor and so in market Match the power transmission equipment to be intended duty. Evaluate system effectiveness. Monitor and sustain the pump and system to maximize benefits. Consider the energy wasted using control valves, 
So if we are throttling the balls, then definitely we are uh, losing the efficiency. And we saw in our previous presentation, instead of uh, throttling the ball, if we, we are using uh, speed control uh, measures, then we can increase the efficiency of our pump filters. Utilize auxiliary services wisely, optimize preventive maintenance, maintain, maintain the internal pump clearance, follow available guidelines regarding the rewinding of motors, analyze the existing pump system, for improvement and up opportunities. So these are some of the checklists which we can follow in uh, our uh, uh, pump uh, uh, buying decisions. So how Andrix is doing uh, basically. So Andrix is a manufacturing pump since uh, more than 165 years now. And uh, we proudly say our pumps are high in highest in efficiency. A strong process know-how because we, we also uh, tech, uh, as technology partner for many industries and uh, we provide technology for uh, uh, hydropower plants metal pulp and paper and other feed and biofuel industries so we know basically the, the we have the whole know-how and then uh, the, using that know-how basically we develop the pumps which fit for the industry and with the low life cycle so I want to share one video uh, how Andritz is doing in this. Founded in 1852 as a small iron foundry in Katz, Austria, Andritz has grown to become an international technology group. Andritz operates over 250 production sites, as well as service and sales companies all around the world. The Andritz Group ranks among the global market leaders in all four of its business areas. For more than a century, Andritz has been engineering and manufacturing centrifugal pumps, gathering extensive experience. Find the entire value added chain under one roof, beginning with R&D, then continuing with design, manufacture, project management, installation, and after sales service. Our pumps operate in water, seawater, and wastewater applications. They are used in water supply, irrigation, flood control, offshore platforms, and desalination plants, as cooling water pumps in power plants, or as lift water pumps for mine drainage, and in pulp and paper, sugar, as well as many other industrial applications. Andritz pumps are also used to generate energy, either with our pumps operating as turbines or with hydrodynamic screw turbines. Decades of experience in manufacturing hydraulic machines and full process know-how form the basis for our pumps high performance. We currently develop and test our pumps and turbines at eight locations in Austria, Canada, China, Germany, Finland, and Switzerland. By networking these research and development centers, we achieve a continuous transfer of know-how within the Andritz Group, all to the benefit of our customers. All of our workshops are constantly evaluating and improving their manufacturing processes to ensure short to lead times, as well as highest quality and reliability for our customers. We guarantee the high technical standard of our pumps with top manufacturing standards, clearly defined processes, and well-trained employees. Quality assurance and process requirements, as well as the quality of the pumps, 
are defined uniformly and implemented worldwide. Motivated, highly qualified, and diverse team of more than 300 employees at numerous locations worldwide. Dedicated to providing the ideal work solution for every requirement and working together to secure customer satisfaction with high quality products and outstanding service all around the world. For further information, go to andritz.com slash pumps or contact us via email pumps at andritz.com. Founded in, founded in 1852 as a small iron family. So, this was uh, a small video what we uh, are doing in uh, uh, pump uh, in different different uh, locations. And uh, so, uh, Mr. Thinking, Praveen, yeah. uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, can you please conclude in two minutes? Yeah, sure. So basically, Android ha is having competence from a single source, starting from research and development till the after sales and service. So everything is in house for Android, and uh, uh, we have all the facility in house. Like we don't have to look to any other organization for development of uh, products or technology for uh, us. So if you can see, this is our. Uh, these are our uh, test centers uh, worldwide uh, we have uh, we basically work on our own developed software and hardware everywhere in all the locations uh, these are the test loop location for android uh, worldwide we have uh, seven type of test field that is thermal cycling test vacuum uh, vpi uh, plant then chemical laboratories bearing test stand fan and cooler test stand balancing pit large rotating machine fields so everything we have in house, we have all the certifications in uh, place. We serve uh, many industries like uh, water, pulp and paper, food, mining, power, and other industries also. So from one source, we starting from wire to water, we can deliver everything uh, for the industries like all type of instruction form, uh, vertical. Uh, pumps, submersible pumps, cell priming pumps, split casing, medium consistency, high pressure pumps, vertical long soft pump, concrete volute, vertical volute, then pump used as a turbine. We are also doing uh, uh, submersible pumps and motors and main uh, coolant pump for re reactor uh, full, uh, nuclear power plants. So, we have a VT pump up to 70,000 meter cube per hour. Then we have volute pump up to 100 meter cube per second and up to 140 megawatt. Then uh, concrete volute pump up to 40 meter cube per second. Then vertical uh, horizontal split casing multi stage pump up to 10 meter cube per second and 40 megawatt. Then FGD pumps also and this too. So we have basically big variety of solutions to best satisfy our customer need and uh, excellent efficiencies, low energy consumption, good NPSH, lower civil engineering cost, and long time travel free operation. So you can see these are our locations in India, and we have many pumps uh, installed in India, uh, starting from one kilowatt, and it goes up to uh, 100 megawatt like we have uh, some of the installation in India which uh, uh, like for river uh, water linking and uh, like uh, and also for uh, irrigation sector one of the very prestigious project is Kaleshwaram where we have supplied uh, approximately 27 pumps totally now and uh, uh, like Kaleshwaram 1 and stage 1 and stage 2 where we delivered uh, up to 40 megawatt pumps and with the efficiency up to 91.5 percent so such a high efficiency for pumps and that is also with the low life cycle cost so thank you very much for your attention and over to you mr
Yeah, thank you, Mr. Pravin. Uh, thanks for showing us, uh, taking us through the entire uh, journey of pumps, uh, even showing the checklist and your excellent examples. And uh, the pump efficiency going as high as 91% is a big news, and uh, all of us can learn and then uh, try to adopt your latest energy efficient pumps. Of course, uh, the participants will have a lot of questions, and then uh, uh, they will uh, contact you uh, through directly or uh, through the chat box. So uh, once again, thank you, Mr. Uh, Praveen. So with that, I will uh, just like to uh, present a few slides from our side um, uh, on accelerating industrial energy efficiency. Uh, what are all the new things uh, that can be done across the industry? We just wanted to cover the agenda will be. I will not repeat uh, what our uh, previous speakers said on the importance of low carbon growth, and then uh, that can be achieved by voluntary initiatives, benchmarking, electrification, ESCO and PRSF, and then uh, the supply chain initiatives, and then a uh, few slides on our activities. What are all the current uh, new opportunities we want to work with the industry and uh, what we can uh, uh, act as a facilitator or a catalyst like our our uh, country and the civilization has been uh, has been uh, very long and then uh, still it is very dynamic. Even 1000 years before we were attracting uh, everybody to our country, even today, uh, India is the biggest market. Everybody is looking forward to India as a big market. So as uh, as similar as our energy consumption levels are, we account for 6% uh, of the total uh, total energy. Let me get the pointer. Yeah. And uh, it is expected to increase by 11% by 2040. So energy is vital uh, for development and uh, uh, prosperity of any economy. Of course, uh, uh, we are uh, in growing stage. We are in dynamic stage, and uh, we have a lot of potential to improve further. And uh, uh, we also have our commitment. And uh, there is no colder country today, no warmer country today. Everywhere the uh, climate is uh, totally messed up. We need to we need to uh, address it. And also at the same time, because we are growing uh, in terms of uh, modernization, in terms of becoming a developed country, we also have the opportunity to set our path in a greener way. So that is the advantage. We have to align our actions in line with our country's uh, uh, commitment of uh, emission intensity reduction of 33 to 35 percent by 2030. And uh, like our prime minister said in the Independence Day, yahi samaya hai aur sahi samaya hai. So we need to work and then uh, we need to uh, promote our energy efficiency, we need to accelerate it. It can be based on policies and programs targeting, and it can be uh, based on our voluntary initiatives, which our industry is very uh, forward looking, and then they take proactive steps. I think we need to accelerate it further to make that. And uh, the carbon footprint or the GHG emissions, it has come from a long way. Today, we are uh, uh, the GHG or the carbon emission or uh, uh, aiming for low carbon growth has become an uh, integral part of uh, business strategy. So all of us are aware about the GHG. All of us are uh, uh, aware of about carbon footprint. We all want to uh, grow in a sustainable way and CII can definitely act as a catalyst and a facilitator to uh, shift the uh, uh, GHG management in a better way. And then uh, we also have uh, the push and pull strategy. There are uh, government uh, private uh, complementing each other. There are a lot of regulations coming up. And at the same time, as I mentioned, our industry is also well prepared and they are uh, doing a lot of uh, initiatives, either whether it is uh, EP100 or RE100, we have examples. And then uh, we have uh, the, uh, the systems and recognition. We have our energy efficiency roadmaps. We have uh, the benchmarking and tools. These are the various voluntary initiatives our industry is uh, taking up to, uh, to move towards uh, low carbon growth or move towards uh, net zero or uh, uh, carbon neutral. So this can be achieved in many ways. One, the first fundamental step is GHG uh, accounting. Almost all the companies uh, present here, uh, presented uh, during the energy award, they have done this accounting. But if any of you are yet to start, please do start. And you please involve, uh, we should involve our supply chain to take them along with us so that we become globally competitive and sustainable. And one of the easiest lever to achieve uh, low carbon growth is energy efficiency. And uh, that is why uh, we are all here. 
and then uh, the other way of uh, scientifically doing it is the uh, science based targets which which help us to align our goal in line with the international uh, uh, international scenarios in line with the 2 degrees and 1.5 degree uh, scenario that is what we wanted to do and then uh, so far about uh, 850 companies have applied uh, 350 companies uh, target approved and then uh, 40 companies from India has applied, and then uh, the number is going on increasing. And it is a very good sign, and our uh, industry in alignment with the international marking. So to achieve this low carbon growth, I would like to uh, say a few levers. One of the levers can be the benchmarking. Of course, uh, in the past 22 years in Energy Award, one of the main objective of Energy Award is to bring in the benchmarking and use that as a, use that as a tool to improve the energy efficiency. And then uh, it can be at a various uh, level for uh, they say like in any domain or any any area or in any uh, aspect of life, the more deeper you go, more you realize and more you become uh, excellent. So even in energy benchmarking, this is the same thing. So though we have uh, the energy benchmarking, there are some uh, top leaders who have done that in an excellent way. There are many sectors who are yet to have uh, this benchmarking to, done to be in a precise way. So we can start with the uh, sector level and then uh, the unit level, the process level. Say if we say like our product is uh, varying every year and the conditions are varying, the technologies are varying, then go to equipment level, go to section level. So you will get actionable insights the more deeper you go, you need a precise data. You, you understand what are all the functional parameters which control, and then uh, you also get into data integration. With the IoT and automation, with uh, today's uh, technology advancement, uh, we can do benchmarking in a much better way, and then we can uh, uh, tap the potential, and then we can achieve uh, greater results. So it's an effective tool for energy efficiency improvement a macro long term strategy for improvement and process for actionable insight for energy efficiency improvement and then we can also use this as a partnership record for developing uh, detailed benchmarking for sector and uh, cii will uh, has been uh, facilitating and uh, we can continue to work with all of you and then making energy benchmarking in a much better way though these sectors have done that in a greater way but uh, there are equipment level benchmarking that can be done process level benchmarking section wise benchmarking and and sector wise benchmarking that can be done. There are other uh, international organizations, IEA is doing, World Steel is doing, Aluminium is doing, Solomon Associates is doing, our country Bureau of Energy Efficiency has been uh, trying and putting a lot of efforts on uh, using benchmarking as a tool to improve the energy efficiency. We from CII, GBC will also will be very happy to associate with the, every one of you in whatever way we can support in making benchmarking as a important tool and use that as a tool to improve further. And then uh, in during the uh, last 22 years of energy award, uh, though we have been releasing benchmarking for a few sectors, we have seen in every year, year after year, the new benchmarks are set, new targets are achieved, new goals are set, like your Olympic Games or any other sports, even uh, the energy efficiency, the uh, cost reduction is a key driver in industry and it will remain to remain a key driver in future. So benchmarking definitely uh, will be a tool, will be an, an effective tool for uh, uh, controlling our cost, controlling our energy efficiency. And then uh, the next opportunity is, like our uh, Prime Minister said, we are aiming at uh, uh, 450 gigawatt of uh, renewable energy. We want to become uh, uh, zero import of uh, energy in 2040 or 2050 when we want to achieve uh, our 100 years of independence. So we need to also see with increasing uh, uh, the renewable energy, with increasing the electrification, how can we avoid our fossil fuel? Maybe the jury members also felt that in future, even the percentage of fossil fuels, how much energy we are getting from fossil fuel should be uh, a key lever to assess a company whether it is excellent, whether it is sustainable. So definitely we are working on a project which is uh, executed by Bureau of Energy Efficiency, which is uh, uh, supported by Bureau of Energy Efficiency on uh, electrification, how we can uh, convert the processes from fossil fuel to electrification and electrification based on renewable energy or green sources. So that uh, we would be very happy. We look forward to your support and then uh, work with you, take your inputs, and then we request you to participate in uh, the consultation workshops 
identification of barriers and opportunities uh, we want to take all your inputs and then uh, make uh, our country uh, more greener and sustainable and uh, reduce uh, the fossil fuel uh, usage as minimum as possible so this is another uh, key lever or area i just wanted to wanted to uh, bring to your attention and then seek your support in working together the other uh, uh, thing in the last two years in covid uh, what we have seen is uh, though the uh, industry including msme which is our major contributor for our gdp as well as uh, for the industry and for the employment so they they are, though they are uh, very much impacted but uh, what they were uh, uh, they gave a feedback is they are very positive on energy efficiency now they see more important uh, uh, energy efficiency as a more important tool most important tool to uh, implement to make their businesses profitable but uh, uh, what they are interested is implementing through esco model wherein uh, we have uh, the investment done by uh, the uh, the technology providers and then uh, we uh, get the uh, payback or we pay the uh, uh, return after achieving the savings so in that uh, we are also uh, very happy to work and we are working with the 20 plus esco companies and uh, we are working with uh, various industries so we can uh, uh, facilitate for esco model if you are interested and then uh, uh, we can conduct feasibility study and identify key technologies uh, we can prepare a dpr we can associate facilitate you with uh, the esco companies and another advantage is now uh, sidb has a uh, prs of scheme wherein uh, uh, wherever uh, see uh, one thing we want to say is energy efficiency technology uh, almost all the energy efficiency technologies are uh, uh, completely successful they will definitely give returns but even if there is a doubt from the financial point of view or from the uh, from the uh, technology point of view if any new technology is uh, implemented so uh, this prs of covers the uh, provides about 75% guarantee on energy efficiency loans and then it gives the confidence to the financial institution who is supporting us the energy efficiency project we all of all of us know that in few countries like china the esco is a very great success and uh, i think we should also start at the uh, same pace level we should accelerate this and the cia can facilitate act as a catalyst in promoting this in the last few months uh, we have aggregated more than 35 projects uh, close to about uh, 45 crores of investment Uh, people have shown interest in esco and uh, we will be definitely uh, make this number uh, would like to see this number 350 or 1000 uh, uh, not restricting to not restricting to 100 or a few uh, investment so as i mentioned there are about 20 plus technologies uh, which we can be can be uh, replicated across the industry we have escos with us we have uh, the all the stakeholders support with us we can uh, work together and then uh, take this esco movement uh, forward so if you need any further detail we'll be very happy to assist you so that is one area where we need your support and then we can take it and apart from that uh, not only these 180 companies who are presenting today or who are getting awarded today it is also important for us to take our supply chain along with us so in this prs of scheme the majority of the, the main objective of the scheme is to promote msme which is our supply chain so please let us know how can we work with your supply chain and then make them uh, greener and then so that is what i wanted to say so the supply chain is very important we need to uh, grow together we need to share our best practices with everybody and then we need, we are again uh, uh, interested or we can facilitate the capacity building of your supply chain feasibility study can be conducted the pilot installations can be done at free of cost trials can be done and then uh, it can also be accumulated and then uh, the products can be or the technologies can be given at a very low price in the last one year despite the pandemic we have been uh, uh, happy to share that with the, the technology providers and the msme support uh, we facilitated 150 plus crores of investment across 1000 msmes in the last one year despite the pandemic so that shows the potential uh, of course the potential is much higher this may be only 10% or 5% of what is potential available in the country the potential is much higher the people are interested yahi samay hai sahi samay hai we can work with your supply chain and then make uh, your supply chain and your organization uh, greener and move towards low carbon growth and uh, uh, to take few slides on our activities so if you want to make your working place your colonies your uh, uh, your uh, area greener our igbc is there we can make you greener and then uh, if you want to work uh, our all our activities in our organization to move towards a greener and sustainable way the green co company rating is there if you want to differentiate your product 
uh, when you want to uh, present it to the customers or stakeholders, Dinpo certification can make you to help to differentiate your product in a greener way. And of course, uh, we will continue to work with energy efficiency because energy is our uh, driving force. So that's why in our culture, we promote Shakti more than uh, Shiva. And uh, we have a uh, lot of uh, several initiatives. I would like to highlight only one or two. Uh, please be in touch with us anytime you need uh, any support. We'll be very happy to uh, work with you and then uh, provide you support. Now people are uh, using carbon footprint and the LCA as a tool for taking decisions to uh, uh, target the business strategy and then uh, move forward. We can definitely support you in uh, arriving at uh, the low carbon growth, developing a roadmap and then uh, uh, help us uh, to, to take through LCA that can be done. See, generally, any new technology, uh, the two challenges they face is, one is the reference or example, second is the initial investment support. So, uh, Unido is implementing a program called uh, FLCTD, facilitating low carbon technology deployment program, uh, along with the support of Bureau of Energy Efficiency. They want to uh, bring in 200 new technologies, innovative energy efficient technologies, and get deployed across the country. We are part of this uh, project. We got the opportunity to work in this project. And uh, so far, uh, more than uh, 40 technologies have been implemented, tested, uh, starting from uh, uh, ice freezer to uh, waste heat recovery in a cement plant. And uh, the main advantage of this uh, program is all of them are new and innovative technologies uh, validated by jury panel and Bureau of Energy Efficiency and UNIDO. And then uh, it also has a grant of about 35 lakhs per technology. So uh, there are a lot of opportunities. If you want to become the pilot, please let us know. If you want to come forward in implementing technologies, which is available at a very low price, please let us know. And if you are an innovative technology provider, please apply and participate in this program. The other one is, uh, uh, similarly, we have about 30 plus companies who are having uh, a lot of products, a lot of innovative products, which can be implemented across the industry through our ACE program. So that also can be done. And then uh, we do facilitate uh, technology transfer among the countries, between the countries. So that is also another area. So we have a lot of technologies from Sweden. So if you are interested, we can support you in implementing this. So you know, last but not the least, we are also uh, facilitating uh, the co-processing or circular economy, which can save a lot of uh, resources, which can save a lot of uh, raw materials, which can save energy efficiency, which can help us to take uh, move towards uh, sustainability. So this is another area where we are uh, actively working and we'll be happy to support uh, all the sectors and your supply chain uh, through this. So with this, uh, I would conclude. So if you are uh, interested in uh, uh, working in any of these areas, uh, please let us know. So we'll be very happy to uh, work together and then uh, we can take it forward. So with that, uh, I will uh, conclude my presentation. So I'll just see the chat box if there are any questions. And uh, our, uh, the supporters, uh, Danfoss, our speakers are available in the exhibition area, uh, both Andres and uh, Danfoss. So you can uh, uh, talk to them, you can discuss with them, you can chat with them. And uh, we have uh, also a lot of interesting presentations coming up. So please join us. So with that, uh, uh, with your permission, Mr. Praveen and uh, uh, Mr. Sujit, uh, we will conclude this session. Uh, thank you all. Uh, and then uh, the next session will start exactly at 11.30. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Praveen. Thank you.